Well, I want to say good morning to you again. Um, if I haven't had a chance to meet you, my name is Al, and I'm the lead pastor at Compassion Christian. Uh, if you are a first-time guest, we are so glad that today is the day that you chose to be here. It's our grand opening uh, weekend at uh, our newly restored building, and so you couldn't have come at a better time. And so we want to thank you for that. We want to thank you for uh, just making time out of your schedule to be here today. If you would do us a special favor, uh, inside of your worship folder when you came in, there is a connect card. If you would just take a few moments and take that out, and really, this is for all of our members and regular attenders as well. We'd love to have a record of your attendance as a first-time guest. We'd love to know about you. And so you can fill that out. And then if you will hold on to it uh, until the end of the service and then turn it in at our connecting point table, which is going out these doors and to the left, we will give you a Starbucks gift card just as our way of saying thank you uh, for being here and letting us know about your time with us. Uh, our members and our regular attenders also use this card to communicate prayer requests, to let us know about address changes, other things like that that are going on. So make sure that you do that. There's also a way that if you want want to make a decision for Christ, there is something on the back where you can indicate what your decision is. So please make sure that you take a few moments today and look that over. So if you're a first time guest, complete the card, hold on to it, turn it in the connecting point table, and we'll give you a Starbucks gift card. Uh, I also want to say welcome to everyone who's here today uh, for this grand opening weekend. How do you like my new podium? Isn't it pretty sweet? Um, custom made uh, by Gary and Grant Weckerly here in the church, and so we want to thank them for their job. What an awesome, uh, what an awesome piece of furniture this is! So I'm, I'm very excited for it. Um, so today we're we're starting out kind of a new era in the life of this church, and I thought that we should do a series that is based on some questions that are burning questions in our culture. Questions that, that people ask, even, uh, you know, sometimes we may not have the answer to them, we may not want to know, we may not know how to answer, but I believe that they're burning questions nevertheless. And so today, I'm starting this new series, and so I want to start out by asking you a question that you probably have already received today. You've probably already been the recipient of it. Maybe you yourself have even asked this question today, how are you doing? When someone asks you that question, how are you doing? Typically, in, in polite conversation, you just say, I'm great, I'm doing fine, especially when you show up at church, right? I mean, this is a place where everybody who comes here has life all figured out, right? That, 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 I mean, the only way you can get in this building is if your life is just idyllic, that everything is perfect, that all is going well. That's the only way we'll let you in, right? And we can just tell. We've got a sensor. You didn't realize this, but in our restoration process, we put in a meter that actually... Can, can focus in on your negative emotions. And we know if you're not, if you're not, uh, okay, I'm just kidding. I can't keep that up very long. I'm not a very good liar, I guess. Um, but you know, so uh, I'm going to ask you today a series of questions based on that one. How are you doing? And maybe sometimes we need to ask the question, how are you doing really? How are you doing really? I'm wondering this morning if some of you might think that you had to put on a mask before you came into this building. When someone asks you, how are, how are you doing, did you have to put on a brave front and say, I I'm fine, I'm, I'm doing okay, but really you aren't? Do you feel like you have to pull it together when you come to a gathering of the church? Because it, you imagine that most everybody who comes here has, has things going well for them. Are you troubled and depressed this morning perhaps, but you don't think you should discuss it in church? You think that, okay, if I just go to church, it's going to make it all go away. Or maybe some people are not even here today and they're watching uh, on, on our live stream on Facebook. And the reason that you're not here is that you want a connection with God, but you don't feel as if your life is together quite yet and you can't make it. You can't be here because you don't feel like you, you deserve to be here. Maybe some of you think that there is some type of stigma attached if you ever feel down and depressed or despondent. Like you think, well, that's not how Christians are supposed to feel. I'm, I'm not supposed to feel that way, right? Uh, I mean, I'm walking with God. I'm filled with the Spirit. I'm making progress as a Christian. I shouldn't feel depressed. Why do I feel that way? Maybe even you've been taught the dangerous doctrine that it's, that it's a sin for a Christian to be depressed. I want to go ahead and dispel that, that myth right now because it is not. Because sin can cause a lot of things. Sin can cause us to have guilt. It can cause us to have lousy relationships, just to name a few. And sin can be a factor in depression. Okay, we can admit that. But being depressed is not a sin. After all, I suspect there are a lot of normal people in here 
who love God, and but still you have days, weeks, or even seasons in your life when things aren't going very well, and, and you wrestle with depression. You wrestle with the downtimes. That doesn't mean you're a bad person. It doesn't mean you're ungodly. It means you're real. So welcome. Welcome to this real place where we can all be real with each other, because life has a way of getting you down. Adversity can come at your life in waves. Every single one of us has struggles. Now, for most people, it's just a day or two when we're down or, or a week or two, but we might even go into a season of grieving when we've had a tragic loss, maybe when a relationship has ended or we've, had, we've gone through a divorce or we've had the death of a loved one or we've, we've faced some unexpected health challenges. Those things can cause us to be depressed as well. But so let's acknowledge that it's okay to not be okay, to coin a phrase. Uh, th there are people, though, who tend to, toward depression a little bit more, and it's just the way they're wired. Their downs are much deeper. They're, they're more complicated. They last longer. And it's not as easy for them to bounce back. And so I, I want to, to put your mind at ease for a moment that I'm not here to tell you that there's one single silver bullet that's going to, to cure and help you overcome your feelings of depression. I'm not going to tell you that. I'm not going to just tell you, hey, focus on the Word of God and your depression will go away. Well, you can't tell someone who's depressed that because often when you're depressed, you don't feel like reading. I can't just be your motivational speaker and say, hey, guys, just snap out of it because you don't feel like doing anything. I can't tell you, just have the joy of the Lord in your heart because you, you can't stop crying. How can you rejoice in the Lord when you can't stop crying? So few things are as depressing as to try to force yourself to stop being depressed on command. You just can't do that. People who are down can't help but feel out of it, and they can't just snap out of it. And so we can't condemn them for that. So is it any wonder that in Christian circles, we don't like to talk about things like depression? But, you know, people have been grappling with depression for centuries. They've been grappling with this for centuries, and it makes you wonder why. And it makes you wonder, well, why does God allow us to suffer? Why does God allow us to go through these things? Why does God do it? Because, after all, if there's anybody who can do anything about this in our condition, it's God. And so we've often wondered, God, why, why am I still struggling with this after all of these years the late theologian John Stott actually uh, validates these questions that we have when he, when he wrote this. He said, the fact of suffering undoubtedly constitutes the single greatest challenge to the Christian faith and has been in every generation. You can't say that if you're, you're depressed, you're not suffering because you are. In fact, an, another expert on depression wrote this. Depression is as old as human history. The Bible has many examples of people who struggled with, dis with despondency and despair. In his depression and fatigue, Elijah, the prophet, asked for his life to be taken. Jonah felt deeply despondent after God didn't destroy Nineveh, who were his sworn enemies. Jeremiah regretted the day he was born. Job's wife advised him to curse God and die in the midst of suffering and pain. Other well-known church leaders like Martin Luther, John Bunyan, Charles Spurgeon, J.B. Phillips have struggled with depression, and so did political leaders such as Winston Churchill and Abraham Lincoln. In fact, even rock stars struggle with this, as you know from the high suicide rate that they, they face. One of my favorite bands, U2, even though they've made really bad music the last few years, uh, but their, their, their lead singer Bono recently talked in a Rolling Stone article about connecting, uh, after, connecting back with God after he went through an accident. You might remember he suffered facial, arm, and shoulder fractures in a biking accident in New York Central Park, and it caused him to have all kinds of issues with his voice and with his confidence. And so he said in the, in the article, he said, I read the Psalms of David all the time. They are amazing. He is the first bluesman shouting at God, why did this happen to me? So we're not the only ones, and you're not alone if you're feeling that way today. And you need to know that you're not alone at Compassion Christian Church. Even pastors go through feelings of depression, believe it or not. Believe it or not, when you see old happy Al up here in the pulpit, it doesn't always mean that I don't have those feelings, but uh, I, I, I was struck over the last uh, six months. It's, it's from that cave of despair that pastors and other people can often get into that drove two recent suicides by California pastors whose tragic deaths made the news. Two pastors who were, were doing well in their churches, and they had mental, one of them was very vocal about his 
physical health struggles. The other was not. And both left families in their wake wondering why and what they could have done better. Friends, depression is no respecter of persons. It's been called the common cold of emotional disorders, and it only appears to be on the rise. So we can't ignore it. We can't bury our heads in the sand. A lot of people are so afraid in the church. Well, we, don't, we can't combine psychology with theology. But I want to tell you this, friends. God is the one who, who, whose mind it came, all of this came from anyway. He created the human brain. He knows what the human brain needs to heal itself, how the human brain needs to cope with it. And so we can talk about it from a theological perspective. And so the series I'm starting today is called Burning Questions. And these are questions that are swirling around in our culture, and we're going to address some of them. And this morning, the question I'm asking is, is God disappointed in me when I'm depressed? Is God disappointed in me when I am depressed? Now, over the next few weeks, I will address some other burning, some other burning questions, such as, is, is hell really necessary? I'm going to talk about uh, why does God seem angry in the Old Testament and loving in the New Testament? And then in the final week, I'm going to talk about what should I think about LGBTQ issues? Or as some might call this series, six ways to shrink your church in, just a, few, in a matter of a few weeks <laughs> by the topics you're talking about. Well, God's going to get me through this, okay? And, and you've got to stay with me, all right? Don't leave me alone. And so I assure you that all of these questions have answers in the Scripture, all of them do, and so that's why I can be confident, because you don't want to hear just what Al Perry has to think about it. You want to hear what the eternal Word of God has to say about it. So that's why I'm confident. So let's deal with the question at hand today. Is God disappointed in me when I am depressed? I won't make you wait until the end. No. I won't make you wait, okay? But the longer answer is what I hope you will remember as you leave this place today. Here it is. God helps us get back up after depression knocks us down. God is the one who will do that for you. So it should come as a comfort to you that even the godliest of people wrestle with depression on occasion. It's entirely natural and normal for people, even Christians, to have times when life just gets them down. And in the Bible, we've already talked about there are instances of depression. And God did not edit out these ugly emotions. He didn't say, you know what, I can't have that. I can't have the Bible portraying people who struggled. After all, it's all rainbows and lollipops in the Christian life. No, he said, I'm going to let it stay there. I'm, I'm going to let it, I'm going to let people marinate in that. I'm going to let people contend with that and deal with it. And so I'm glad that he did. So I would like for you to take out your message notes today and your Bible. Remember, we always talk from the Bible. All right, that, that is our source of eternal truth. So if you have a Bible app, uh, can we put the, um, the Wi-Fi password and stuff up on the screen again? We do this every week. If you want to connect that way, if, if you are, are dependent upon that, um, and they're going to show you the Wi-Fi password if you want to um, bring it up on your app. If you have your Bibles, though, turn to Psalm chapter 77, which is a classic text, I think, on depression, and it's going to teach us how God helps us get back up. While you're turning to Psalm 77, you can uh, look there, take a picture of the, of the password. And Psalm chapter 77, this is not, incidentally, a Psalm of David. It is a Psalm of Asaph, and we're going to tell you about him in a moment. But Psalm 77, I'm going to read the entire chapter. And so follow along with me in your, uh, in your version of the Scriptures. It says, I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord. At night, I stretched out untiring hands, and I would not be comforted. So does that sound like any nights you've ever gone through? You can probably identify, right? Are you sleepless nights, where are you, God? Verse 3, I remembered you, God, and I groaned. I meditated, and my spirit grew faint. You kept my eyes from closing. I was too troubled to speak. I thought about the former days, the years of long ago. I remembered my songs in the night. My heart meditated and my spirit asked, Will the Lord reject forever? Will he never show his favor again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his, promised, has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in anger withheld his compassion then I thought, to this I will appeal, the years when the Most High stretched out His right hand, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all your works and meditate on all your mighty deeds. Your ways, God, are holy. What God is as great as our God? 
You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. With your mighty arm, you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. The waters saw you, God. The waters saw you and writhed. The very depths were convulsed. The clouds poured down water. The heavens resounded with thunder. Your arrows flashed back and forth. Your thunder was heard in the whirlwind. Your lightning lit up the world. The earth trembled and quaked. Your path led through the sea, your way through the mighty waters. Though your footprints were not seen, you led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Now, there are some things that I think we want to see from this passage that, that teach us from the Word of God. And uh, the first thing that, that I want you to notice is that being close to God does not exempt you from depression. Being close to God does not exempt you from the feelings of depression because the writer of, of Psalm 77 was pretty close to God. His name was Asaph and he was a priest. He and his family were actually one of the, the three chosen families given responsibility for music and songs in the temple of God. In fact, 12 psalms are attributed to the family of Asaph. So he was a guy who was close to God. He knew who the Lord was. He talked to him on, on more than just a few occasions. So he was suffering and he didn't understand it. So he called out to God and he wondered, God, are you upset with me? God, are, are you deaf to my calls? Do you not hear me or recognize me anymore? And he wondered if he'd ever feel better again. And so I'm wondering today, can you identify with that? Have you ever wondered, God, are you ever going to answer any of my prayers again? Are you ever going to give me the assurance that I, that I know you? I mean, he was a guy who was so close to God, and yet he was going through a dark valley. And you see, depression uh, is not cured in just one way. Depression is not worked through in just one cookie-cutter response. And, and God doesn't offer one-size-fits-all solutions. In fact, I can't, I can't give you that either. You see, we need to work through this in a way. In fact, you would be hard-pressed to find two people who go through times of despondency in the same way. But what I think we can do is we can look at how Asaph worked his way through this, and you can see how he came through it on the other side. But you see, every believer is going to struggle with down days and months and seasons, and we can suffer from it in different forms. And some of you in this room are, are wondering, why do I feel so helpless well, it could be because you have gone through any one or combination of tragic life events. You've had the death of a spouse or the death of a relationship or the death of an immediate family member or uh, there, there, maybe your parents have split up. It could be a miscarriage. It could be an abortion, the birth of a baby. It could be disability caused by disease or an accident. You can get depressed for all kinds of reasons. Now, there are also people, and again, I'm not a psychologist, though I play one on Facebook Live. Um, there is clinical depression that is caused by chemical imbalances. And if you are suffering from clinical depression, I want to tell you, you will not get out of it without medical attention. I mean, if you've broken your arm and it's broken and needs to be set, you don't hesitate to go to the doctor to say, I'm going to get this set because if I don't, it's not going to heal properly. And in the same way, friends, you should, uh, you should take the technology and th that is available to you that comes from the mind of brilliant people who, by the way, were created by God, whose brains were created. They may not believe in God, but they have ways of helping you. And then you apply the word of God and then you go to counseling and you will be surprised at the number of people who have been held by antidepressants at some point in their life. Can I get an amen? Amen. All right. It's all right. It's okay to not be okay. So that's the first thing that we do. And the second thing that we, that we learn from this is that we need to recall past blessings to get a present perspective. And that's what Asaph does. This is not, this is not a, a, an RX for you. This is what we learn from Scripture. So here he is. He's laying awake at night. He's allowing his mind to drift, and he's thinking, there's some reason I'm not sleeping. Like, there's some reason that God is not allowing me to sleep. So he began to think about his life in review. That's how it gets when you're depressed. You can't sleep. Your mind jumps from one issue to the next. You're trying to make sense of life. And Asaph realized, you know, it hasn't always been this way. My life hasn't always been in, in this doldrum that I'm in right now. He recalled when God felt near. He remembered the times that he could sense the presence of God. 
And I don't know about you, but his words sound familiar and they ring with me and resonate with me because it, it, when we go through the valley of depression, we often say things like, I don't get it. I don't understand God. How did I feel so close to you in days past? And now I don't feel like I even pray and I want to pray anymore. Now it seems as if you can't be found. Have you ever felt that? So Asaph is here stopping in the middle of the night in the midst of his depression and he makes himself remember God's past blessings. He says, I know it's bad now, but I just want to think about what God has done for me in the past. I want to remember the times he answered my prayers. I want to remember the blessings of my family. I want to remember, and in this case, he remembers the history of how God remembered his people, how God delivered his people from their captivity. And so he stops in the middle of the night and he remembers. And so when you don't feel like thinking about anything in particular, what you should do is mentally make a list of things on which you focus your thoughts. And they need to be positive. They need to be from God. So when you're depressed, though, where does your mind tend to lean? Well, it tends to focus on how bad life is right now. It's like everything is so bad. It's, it's so bad. The, t- the future is going to be terrible. You, you know that life stinks and it's probably going to get worse. It's never going to change. God doesn't feel near. He's left me forever and he'll probably never listen to me again. Friends, that is all negative thoughts that don't come from the, the heights of heaven. They come from the enemy because he wants you to stay where you are. He wants you to say, so that's nonsense. You've got to remember the future. And so you have to fight against it. And, and, and you have to allow the example of looking in the rearview mirror and focus in on God's past blessings. There's also something else to learn from the passage. We learn that God is not afraid of hard questions. You know, a lot of people, this is what really stops you. You're like, you're just wondering, God, why aren't you changing me? Why aren't you healing? Why aren't you giving me victory and freedom from this? Well, Asaph asked God those questions. Now, you may think that God doesn't tolerate those kind of inquiries. You may think that he doesn't want to hear it. But Asaph is simply asking what's already on his heart. God, why? Where are you? Why don't I feel blessed? Why don't I have peace and joy? Why don't I feel blessed? like you are with me. So he's laying awake at night and he's just wondering. He's wondering what is going on. God is not afraid of the hard questions. So where do we go from here? Where do we go? Well, with, with, with all of these things in mind, when we face bouts of depression, what do we do? Now, again, I want to point out there's no quick spiritual bullet, magical formula, sp- something that you can repeat and chant. I'm not saying that at all, but God has provided powerful and timeless principles in Psalm 77 to help you and I do battle when we get lured into these feelings of despondency. So, uh, again, I want to say a disclaimer. If you have clinical depression, should see a therapist. You should get medicine on board, um, just like you would get a broken arm set. Okay, it's not all about just have more faith and pray. That's usually a way of only making someone feel worse about themselves to say you don't have enough faith. That's why you're depressed, friends. You don't know the whole story, and if you do, even if you do know, that's not going to help. Okay, so here's the first thing you should do: you should scrutinize your emotions, scrutinize them, question them, examine them. Be just like, okay, is this how I really feel? I want you to understand that it is normal to feel depressed now and then, okay? I know I'm Captain Obvious on that, but here's the first thing thing that you need to think because you need to remember, I'm going to have these seasons. There are going to be ups and downs. Life is not always what we portray on Facebook and Instagram, all right? It, It isn't. It's not what we portray in our family portraits. Life isn't always about vacations. Life is about the in between what we do in the here and now. And so we, we, when we get in that place, we think, okay, I know that, that I'm going to feel this way because when we, we don't allow ourselves to, to think about it correctly, we tend to think that something terrible is going to happen to us. You know, the first time you get down, uh, you might have physical fatigue or major trauma or a great loss. All of those things can bring you a form of depression, but you can have a tendency to assume, well, I'm to blame for this. I'm a bad person. This is all my fault. I've sinned against God. Remember, occasional depression is normal. So is your focus, though, on the problems you're facing or on your response to your problems? Let me ask you that again. Is your focus on the problems you're facing or on your response? You see, sometimes it's our response. As long as we focus on problems, they tend to grow. 
As long as we say, I'll never get out of this, you probably will have a hard time and it'll be longer. But the moment we gain perspective and focus our response in, in, in the right way, then we get a new perspective and we'll move from being a victim to being victorious. And the problems won't overwhelm us that much. And then the second step you need to make is you need to examine your behavior. You scrutinize your emotions and realize, okay, I can't always trust my emotions. And then secondly, I examine my behavior. What do I do? What do you do when you get depressed? How do you deal with it? How do you, how do you cope? Do you choose positive or negative responses to your depression? Now, one component of depression is a battle of the will. And it's crucial to ask yourself and honestly answer what your behavior is indicating about your response to your depression. What do you do when you get depressed? Some people slip into escapism behavior. Now, I'm about to start stepping on toes here. Maybe I don't know, but um, maybe we start losing people right now. But if you're slipping into escapism behavior that involves food or binge watching Netflix or procrastination, excessive sleeping, even worse, drugs, alcohol or other addictive chemicals and, and, and practices, you know immediately that you're in a downward spiral because you feel like that's the only way you can lubricate your emotions. That's the only way you can deal with it is to dull the emotions when in fact that's probably the worst thing you can do because soon to follow will be feelings of guilt which turn in or which in turn reinforce your already negative thoughts and your already bad feelings about yourself. So don't always trust your emotions and then examine your behavior. What am I doing when I go through this? So, so what I would recommend that you do is to go back to what we talked about earlier is make yourself go through the past blessings that you've received and say, okay, what hope does the past give me for the future? What good in my life do I have to, to break out of this and break through this for? You see, it's a pattern that Asaph used, and it's biblical. So it's not going to hurt you to feel the emotions that you do. And you should not see yourself as less of a Christian or less, as, as less of a follower of God. You should see yourself as a normal person who's just dealing with it. But you do it in a healthy, life-giving way, in a way that helps you bounce back, in a way that makes you available for your family and your spouse and everybody who depends on you. That's what the, the Word of God teaches us, that we're not alone because God is always with us. He's always there. He's always willing to answer. So let's pray today as we close out. Father, we know that um, just one sermon is not going to totally solve all of our struggles emotionally. Lord, but I pray that today someone who's come in here and has felt as if all the world is against them and that their life will never get better. Lord, I pray that their spirit has been uplifted and that they have hope as they walk out today because, Lord, that's what we deal in around here. We deal in hope. We deal in the hope of the glorious power of Jesus Christ, the power to forgive us. So, Lord, some people in this room today just need to hear that. They need to hear from your word today that you are the one who heals and God, I pray that after seeking all the other avenues that they can seek, Lord, that they would also turn to you. God, I pray that someone in this church may be a link in the chain for someone to heal. To heal from, from this mental uh, stress that, they're, that people are going through. Lord, help us bear each other's burdens. Help us in the name of Jesus to be compassionate and caring and attentive to people who need our help. Thank you, God, for Jesus, and we pray in his name and for his sake. Amen.